Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi and welcome back everyone. In this video presentation, we will be discussing government grant and assistance and how to account for them and some required disclosures by the standard. To start the conversation about government grants and assistance, I just want to share with you examples of government assistance through a few government agencies. Some are assistance in terms of cash, either non-repayable funding or loan, while others in terms of other incentives. Here we have an example of Bank Negara Malaysia, SME Corp, that are overlooking the development of small and medium enterprises in Malaysia, and MTDC or Malaysian Technology and Development Corporation, that are overlooking the development of technology and its industry in Malaysia. These are some of examples of assistance by Bank Negara Malaysia for SMEs. We have categories like innovative startups, entrepreneurship, ICT and e-commerce, export, micro-entrepreneurs, women and youth. Under SME Corp, there are various categories of assistance offered such as capacity building, marketing, financing, branding and many more which under each category, there are various subcategories of assistance. Under MTDC, like SME Corp, there are various types of assistance offered, including business funding. Under business funding, there are few options for tech companies to work together with MTDC to enhance and develop their companies through investment by MTDC in the companies. For example, here we have under BEF or Business Expansion Funding, tech companies are offered funding for purchase of equipment, working capital expenses, overhead costs, cost of technology, intellectual capital and marketing and promotion. And of course, other government agencies such as this, offering different kind of assistance for different group of business community. What's shown here are only some of them so you can find out about them and other agencies via their websites. Just search and ask. So under MRFS 120, Accounting for Government Grants and Disclosure of Government Assistance, we will try to discuss few relevant questions such as, is the grant an income that should be recognised in income statement? Or is it a capital thus should be recognised in equity? As usual, the first thing that we need to discuss is definition of terms so that we understand the scope in which the standard is applied to. Government assistance is action by government designed to provide an economic benefit specific to an entity or range of entities qualifying under certain criteria. And the assistance for the purpose of this standard does not include benefits provided only indirectly through action affecting general trading conditions such as the provision of infrastructure in development areas or by the impositions of trading constraints on competitors. In other words, the government assistance that applies to this standard are those directly provided and specific to an entity. Government grants are assistance by government in the form of transfers of resources to an entity in return for past or future compliance with certain conditions relating to the operating activities of the entity. Based on the definitions of government grant just now, there are few things to be highlighted here. First, Government grant is part of government assistance. Second, it must be in terms of transfer of resources, be it cash or assets or other resources. Third, the transfer of resources is due to the entity complying with conditions given by the government in relation to the entity's operation. Which means, if the entity did not comply with the condition given, it might be required to repay the resources transferred or it might not be granted with transfer of resources. And the resources can be transferred either for future consumptions of the entity 
or for payments of expenses that has already been incurred by the entity, just like a refund or a compensation. Government grants in this standard exclude those assistance in a form that cannot reasonably have a value placed upon them, such as free technical or marketing advice and the provisions of guarantees. And it also excludes transactions with government which cannot be distinguished from the normal trading transactions of the entity, such as a government procurement policy that is responsible for apportions of the entity's sales. The existence of the benefits in this case might be unquestioned, but any attempt to segregate the trading activities from government assistance could well be arbitrary. The receipt of government assistance by an entity may be significant for the preparations of the financial statements for two reasons. Firstly, if resources have been transferred, an appropriate method of accounting for the transfer must be found. Secondly, it is desirable to give an indication of the extent to which the entity has benefited from such assistance during the reporting period. This facilitates comparison of an entity's financial statements with those of prior periods and with those of other entities. There are two types of grants identified in this standard. The first one is grants that are related to assets. This refers to government grants whose primary condition is that an entity qualifying for them should purchase, construct or otherwise acquire long-term assets or non-current assets. And subsidiary conditions may also be attached restricting the type or locations of the assets or the periods during which they are to be acquired or held. The subsidiary condition is optional. It may not always be there, but the primary condition must be related to assets. The other identified type of government grants is grants that are related to income. This is the type of grants that is generally other than those related to assets. So everything else other than for acquiring assets will be categorized under this category. And basically, this type of grants is meant for operational activities that is to cover certain expenses of the entity. One more term that we need to define is forgivable loans. Now this is referring to loans, not grant by government agencies. But at times, depending on the situation and condition, the loan can be made non-repayable, thus the term forgivable. You are forgiven, so you do not have to repay the loans. Thus, it will be, in substance, similar to a grant. So forgivable loans defined by the standard as loans that the lender undertake to waive repayment under certain prescribed conditions. In terms of recognition, similar to the general recognition's criteria, it can only be recognized if it is probable and can be reliably measured. So in terms of government grant, an entity must comply with conditions attached. And unless the entity complies with those conditions, the grant will not become transferable. Therefore, it is all depends on the compliance or non-compliance of the entity. So there must be a reasonable assurance that the grant will be received, meaning there must be a reason for you to believe that you will meet the condition attached to the grant. Note that in paragraph 8, it says that receipts of grants, meaning the transfer of resources into our possessions or into our bank account, cannot be taken as evidence that the condition attached to it will be fulfilled. Because if after a period of time it is perceived that you will not or cannot fulfill the condition attached, the grants can be retreated and you will need to repay them. Similar to forgivable loans, there must be an assurance that you will meet the term for forgiveness to make it probable, or in this case, turn into grant. And once the grants recognize, 
any related contingent liability or contingent asset is treated in accordance with MFRS 137, Provisions, Contingent Liabilities and Contingent Assets. How should we recognize the grant? Paragraph 12 states that an entity should recognize the grant in profit or loss, that is, in the income statement, on a systematic basis over the periods in which the entity recognizes as expense the related costs for which the grants are intended to compensate. Now the standard gives us the idea that it should be somehow brought into profit or loss or the income statement. But how we bring it into income statement depends on two approaches. Capital approach, where the grant is recognized outside profit or loss an income approach where the grant is recognized in profit or loss over one or more period, literally like what paragraph 12 requires. However, both approaches are acceptable. The proponent of capital approach argues that government grant is a financing device, thus it should be dealt with as such in the statement of financial position rather than be recognized in profit or loss to offset the items of expense that they finance. And because no repayment is expected, such grants should be recognized outside profit or loss. They also argue that it is inappropriate to recognize government grants in profit or loss because they are not earned but represent an incentive provided by government without related costs. The proponents of income approach, on the other hand, argues that because government grants are received from a source other than shareholders, they should not be recognised directly in equity, but should be recognised in profit or loss in appropriate periods, which is very logical. And also, they argue that government grants are rarely gratuitous or free, that is without cost. They believe that an entity earns them through compliance with the conditions and meeting the envisaged obligations. They should therefore be recognised in profit or loss over the periods in which the entity recognises as expenses the related costs for which the grant is intended to compensate. And because income and other taxes are expenses, it is logical to deal also with government grants, which are an extension of fiscal policies in profit or loss. One thing to be highlighted here is that it is very important that the grants be recognised on a systematic basis and not based on receipts of the resources or whenever the money, for example, is received, because that will be against the accrual accounting assumption. However, recognition based on cash basis would be acceptable only if no basis existed for allocating a grant for periods other than the one in which it was received. For grants that are given as compensations of expenses or losses that already been incurred in prior financial years or for immediate financial support that has no future related costs, the question will be, in which financial year should the grant be recognised? The year the expenses or losses incurred, that is retrospectively, or should it be recognised in the financial year when the cash is received? For this compensation such as this, we should recognise the grant in the financial year when the grant becomes receivable. That means when the grant becomes probable to be received, neither we need to wait until the cash is received nor recognize it in the year when the expenses or losses were incurred. A government grant may take the form of a transfer of a non-monetary asset such as land or other resources for the use of the entity. In circumstances like this, it is usual to assess the fair value of the non-monetary asset and to account for both grant and asset at that fair value. Alternatively, 
which is sometimes applied, is to record both asset and grant and its nominal amount. For presentations of the grant, it depends on the type of grant, whether it is asset-related or income-related. For government grants related to assets, including non-monetary grants at fair value, they shall be presented in the statements of financial positions either by setting up the grant as deferred income or by deducting the grant in arriving at the carrying amounts of the asset. If we set the grant as deferred income, thus creating deferred grant income account, this is based on income approach. And if we deduct the grant directly from the cost of the asset, this is based on capital approach. For government grants that are related to income, they are presented as part of profit or loss either separately or under a general heading such as other income, meaning having its own line item, or alternatively, we could deduct it directly from the related expense, thus reducing the amounts of the expense. Now let us look at this illustration. What we have here is a company that received few government grants. For the first grant, worth 60,000 ringgit, it was meant for acquiring machines XX. The cost was 200,000 ringgit, the useful life of the machine was 25 years, and the company applies straight line method on monthly basis for depreciation. The second grant worth 20,000 ringgit, it was meant for the maintenance of the machine for financial year 2017 until 2026, a 10-year period. For that, the company provided the information on the maintenance costs for the period between 2017 and 2020 and for the period between 2021 and 2026. The third grant worth 5,000 ringgit, it was meant to cover a preliminary test and preparation before acquiring the machine, which was done in 2016, something that already been incurred by the company. So basically, we have asset-related grant, income-related grant, and compensation for expense that already been incurred in previous year. You are required to prepare journal entries relevant to the financial year 2017 ending 31st December. As mentioned before, for asset-related grants, we have two approaches, capital and income approaches. Let us first consider income approach. Under this approach, we need to create a deferred income account and amortize it over the useful life of the machine to match the grant income with the relevant cost. In this case, the relevant cost is the depreciation. So we need the information about how much that should be matched to depreciation. In this case, the amount is 1,200 ringgit, where the total grant is divided by the useful life of the asset, and for the year 2017, is only for six months. So the general entries will be debit bank account as you receive the cash and create a deferred cron income account. Whenever we charge depreciation, we will recognize the grant as part of income in income statement. So we debit deferred cron income account to be transferred to income statement by crediting other income which will be transferred to income statement as other income. Alternatively, using capital approach, the company can deduct the grant amount from the cost of the machine. And by this, the cost will be reduced and therefore the annual depreciation amount will also be reduced, reflecting the benefit received from the grant. So the general entries will be for the year 2017 debit bank to recognize the receipt of the grant and credit directly the machine account, thus reducing the cost. As for the depreciation, 
the annual depreciation will be reduced from 8,000 ringgit to 5,600 ringgit since the cost has gone down from 200,000 ringgit to 140,000 ringgit. As for 2017 depreciation expense, it will be 2,800 ringgit for 6 months instead of 4,000 ringgit the original amount. The journal entries will then be debit depreciation expense and credit accumulated depreciation with the reduced amount of 2,800 ringgit. For grant number 2, again, this is an income-related grant. Remember the definitions of income-related grant? Grants other than asset-related. So for this grant, it is meant to cover maintenance of the machine for the period between 2017 and 2026, which is for 10 years. And we are also given the expected actual maintenance expenses for that 10 years. The best way to allocate the grant systematically is to allocate it on a proportionate basis based on the expected actual maintenance expense. So we have a total of 8,000 ringgit for the period between 2017 and 2020 and a total of 21,000 ringgit for the period between 2021 and 2026. And that is 29,000 ringgit in total for the 10 year period. So we will get approximately 1,379 ringgit as the portions of grant that can be recognized as income for the year between 2017 and 2020. So the journal entries will be debit bank to record the amounts of cash received and credit deferred grant income with the same amount for every end of 2017 to 2020. And to recognize the grant for the first year of 2017, we will deduct the amounts from deferred grant income account, so we debit the account and credit other income with the same amount. Now this is if we want to present it as other income in income statement. Otherwise, we can credit maintenance expense, thus reducing the amounts of maintenance expense by 1,379 ringgit for the first year thus leaving 621 ringgit as the maintenance expense for 2017. For the third grant, this is to compensate for what already incurred and paid by the company. Thus for this, we should immediately recognize in profit or loss. Thus we debit bank to record the cash received and credit income from government grant account as part of other income in income statement. This exercise is for you. What we have here is a company that acquired an equipment and for that it received a government grant of 160,000 ringgit to be used for the purchase of the equipment. You are required to show the relevant journal entries and extracts from the financial statements at the end of the financial year 2017 and 2018 using the two allowable methods of presentation. Now pause this video and have a go at this exercise. You may resume watching this video when you are done with it. Let us now start with the first method, that is setting up grant income account. So we started off with recording the receipt of the grant of 160,000 ringgit and creating the deferred grant income account. By creating the deferred grant income account, it means that the recognitions of the grant as income will be allocated throughout the useful life of the asset. So for the first year of 2017, we will deduct from the deferred grant income of 16,000 ringgit since the useful life is 10 years and transfer that to other income and this other income will be appearing in the income statement. So in the income statement for both years, 
we have other income of 16,000 ringgit and that will be matched with the depreciations of the equipment of 40,000 ringgit. In the balance sheet, the relevant item will be equipment shown here at its carry amount net of accumulated depreciation and deferred grant income under non-current liabilities and deferred grant income under current liabilities. Now basically, any amount that will be settled within the next 12 months will be current, thus the portions of that will be utilized within the next 12 months will be transferred to current liabilities instead. This is the presentation under method 1. For method 2, instead of recognizing the grant as deferred income, we directly deduct the amount from the cost of the asset. So the carrying amount will now be at 240,000 ringgit of deducting 160,000 ringgit worth of grant. And this will reduce the annual depreciations from 40,000 ringgit to 24,000 ringgit. In income statement, the relevant item will be depreciated at 24,000 ringgit. And in the statement of financial position, we will have only the asset at the carry amount after deducting the grant and the accumulated depreciation. Did you manage to get it right? Very good. Now let us continue. A government grant that becomes repayable shall be accounted for as a change in accounting estimate. For this, we need to refer to MRFRS 108, Accounting Policies, Changes in Accounting Estimates and Errors. But how does a government grant become payable? Well, basically, that is due to entity not fulfilling the condition attached to the grant, such as not using the grant for the purpose it is intended for. Thus, the intended benefits cannot be achieved or entity breaching the terms and conditions of the grant. Repayments of a grant related to income shall be applied first against any unamortized deferred credit recognized in respect of the grant. And if the repayment exceeds the deferred credit, or when no deferred credit exists, the repayment shall be recognized immediately in profit or loss. Say for example, we are granted 200,000 ringgit and we have used 100,000 of it, thus we have a balance of 200,000 ringgit. And the entire grant has become repayable. Thus we credit bank account to record the payment and we debit the deferred credit or deferred income account with amount of the balance to record the eliminations of the balance. And the amounts that we already used, that is 100,000 ringgit, shall be recorded as a loss since you already make the payment in cash. The money is already gone. If we have no balance because we have used the entire amount, we need to record the entire amount of the grant as a loss by debiting the loss account and crediting bank account to record the payment or grant repayable account if we will make the payment only at the date later than when it becomes payable. For grant related to asset, we know that we have two approaches in recording the grant when we receive it, that the repayment will depend on the approach that we have chosen. For capital approach, we already deduct the amount of grant from the value of the asset when we acquire the asset, thus reducing the cost of the assets recorded. Therefore, when the grant becomes repayable, it simply means that now we need to use our own money to pay for the so-called discounted cost of the asset. Therefore, when we make the repayment, we need to also increase the carrying amount of the asset. And for income approach, we will have a balance deferred income. Thus, we reduce or eliminate the balance that we have in the deferred income account just like we did the repayments for grant related to income. 
for income approach, it will be similar with grant related income. So for the case in example 1, we still have a balance of 128,000 ringgit since we only use 32,000 ringgit from the total of 160,000 ringgit. Thus, we eliminate the remaining different income balance. Credit bank to record the payment made, or if we have not paid yet, we credit the grant repayable account instead, and the difference will be the loss. If only the balance becomes payable, thus we need to only return the balance, we will credit bank with the amount equivalent to the balance, and eliminate the balance in deferred grant income. For capital approach, we also need to deal with the accumulated depreciation. Since we have reduced the cost of the asset with the amounts of grant when we acquired the asset, the amounts of depreciation will also be reduced or will be much lower every year than it's supposed to be. When the grant becomes repayable, the cost will be increased and therefore the accumulated depreciation shall also be increased. And the increase is what we refer to as the cumulative additional depreciation. So for the cumulative additional depreciation that would have been recognized in profit or loss to date in the absence of the grant, it shall be recognized immediately in profit or loss. Now say the grant related to asset in example 1 becomes repayable we need to first assess the amount of depreciation that would have been without the grant. So, with the grant, we have accumulated depreciations of 48,000 ringgit, while without the grant, we could have accumulated depreciations of 80,000 ringgit instead. Thus, we need to increase the amount of accumulated depreciation to that 80,000 ringgit. Therefore, the accumulated depreciation needs to be increased by 32,000 ringgit. That is the difference. To record the event of the grant becoming repayable, we debit PP accounts with 160,000 ringgit to increase the cost back to its original amount, and credit bank with the same amount to record the repayment or grant payable account if we will only make the payments in the near future and credit accumulated depreciation account with a difference of 32,000 ringgit and thus the responding debit will be to record the loss on repayment of grant. These are the disclosures required by the standard. Basically, we need to disclose the policy in which we treat government grants including the way we present it. We also need to disclose the nature and extent of the grants. If we could not fulfill conditions attached to the grant, we need to disclose that fact. And if the grant comes with contingencies, we must disclose that too. So that is all about government grants and how we shall treat it. In our next video, we will discuss the accounting policies, accounting estimates and prior period errors, and how we shall treat the changes in the policies and estimate, as well as the corrections of prior peer errors. Until then, thank you very much for your attention and as always, please replay this video if you think you might miss anything. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.